Sorry? Oh, okay, thank you. Right, are we all here? I think um, last time we were talking about equity convertibles, we were looking at the circumstances in which the valuable option contained in the equity convertible, namely the right of the bondholder to convert into, convert the bond into the underlying equity shares of the issuer could be damaged by different types of corporate action. And I think um, we walked through a whole number of them, um, starting with things like subdivision of shares, new issues, issues of convertible at a lower price, capitalization of accumulated profits, large distributions of profit through capital distributions, rights issues, and the question is, 
what can be done about it? And I think we came to the conclusion that really there are only two ways of dealing with it. One is to give notice to the bondholders, to give them, therefore, the option um, of converting the bond into the underlying shares prior to the um, occurrence of the corporate action in question that might damage or reduce the value of their conversion rights. The second was, the more obvious one, was to provide for an adjustment of the strike price in the convertible, uh, which would then take into account the circumstances, uh, corporate actions which are about to occur, and to try and put the bondholder in exactly the same economic position as if the corporate action uh, had not occurred. And I think that's the solution which is usually adopted in most convertible bonds. It's the most obvious, easiest way of doing it. And that's quite helpful because at the end of the day, the reason why a convertible bondholder, a bondholder, sorry, uh, someone invests in convertible bonds is because they want to have the upside of a rising share price in an issuer of bonds. And it is because of that upside, the expectation that the shares will rise in price and that they can, they can, they can then convert at a later point in time the bond which they have purchased and then have the benefit of the rising share price um, which they can then obtain by converting the bond at the strike price. Now, that right is why they invest. And if that right is not protected in the terms of the bond instrument, bond investors are not going to buy. It's as simple as that. So consequently, there has to be a protection mechanism to deal with corporate actions which might damage that value. Now, what these corporate actions might be as you might have guessed, depends entirely on the corporate law applicable to the issuer. So depending on the corporate law applicable to the issuer, there are a whole number of things that corporate entities can do. And it's those that we talk through. And it's not a, by any means an exhaustive list because depending on applicable corporate law that's applicable to the particular issuer, you may have more types of occurrences. And what they might be will be explored, obviously, as usual, through legal opinions from lawyers in the country of the jurisdiction of the issuer. But once you've got through all that, um, by using this conversion price formula, which you'll get, needless to say, from an investment banker who's expert in the area, all that one does is to say, in the following circumstances, there's a list of things that happens, and in those circumstances, the strike price shall be adjusted in accordance with the formula below, and that's how it's done. That's the easy bit. Then comes the more difficult bit, and that turns on mergers and acquisitions in relation to the issue of the convertible. The problem is that if there is a merger or indeed a takeover of the issue of the convertible, the risk is that it's not just a matter of dilution or a negative effect on the value of the conversion right, the impact of the merger or takeover could completely destroy the conversion right that is contained in the convertible bond. What impact a transaction in the form of a merger or takeover will have and what you can do about it depends once again on the applicable corporate law. But broadly speaking, like we did when we were doing syndicated loans, you can try to categorize the types of mergers and acquisitions and takeovers that occur in the developed markets, developed economies, and then try to see how it is that you can structure uh, protective mechanisms in relation to um, the, the, the investors who invest in convertible bonds. To do that, once again, you go back to these merger structures. And if I see anyone copying this down again, I'll say, go back to your notes on syndicated loans. It's all there. Or if not, turn the pages in my book. It's there. Okay, let's deal with each type of merger structure and then see what impact it has on the conversion right of the bondholder and see what can be done about it. Okay? 
So the, the first one is the, the one that you're, I, I hope, reasonably familiar with. Um, the issue of the convertible, shall we say, is Corporation A up here. And that issuer is to merge with another corporate entity, B. Um, and the, the structure of the merger is that all assets and liabilities of the two merging entities will be transferred to a third corporate entity, C. And after that, there is a share exchange between the, the shareholders of A and shareholders of B for shares in C. After which, A Corporation and B Corporation are liquidated. Now, question is, what happens to the convertible bondholders? Well, one answer is, well, the conversion right no longer exists because you are allowed to convert into the shares of A, and A no longer exists. So answer one, conversion right destroyed, doesn't exist anymore. Alternatively, depending on the applicable law, the conversion right may exist, but in relation to the shares of C Corporation, the successor corporation. But then the problem is convertible bonders, bondholders have no idea what, at what price they can convert into the shares of C, because the strike price, if you remember, would have been computed, calculated by reference to the share price of A Corporation, not C. Can you do a price adjustment formula? Well, you can't, because when the bonds are issued by Corporation A, the issuer, no one can do a price adjustment formula because you do not know with what entity A will merge to produce Corporation C. So you can't even have a price adjustment formula. You can certainly have a notice provision saying, in the event of a merger coming up on the horizon, then you will give notice to bondholders, to enable bondholders to convert the bonds into the shares of A before the merger with B is effected. The problem with that is, yes, it's perfectly possible, and it's perfectly possible that bondholders will convert into the shares of A before the merger, but in many cases the merger may occur at a time when the share price of A in the markets is below the strike price which means it would be bloody stupid to actually convert the shares at that price. So it's, in, in a sense, it, it, the conversion right is of no value. So usually to deal with this scenario, a convertible bond would include a provision for a trustee. Trustee being given the power, like an ordinary bond issue, bond trustee, with additional power, whereby it is required to agree with the issuer, A, that if it is going to merge in circumstances where it will cease to exist, then A will be required to agree a conversion price with the trustee at, as to what price C, not A, C, the new corporate entity, will agree to the conversion of the convertibles issued by A, but into the new shares of C Corporation, which means that the trustee has to negotiate with A for a price agreement with C. Now, clearly the trustee has no powers with regard to C Corporation, because its powers are under the convertible bond issued by A. So consequently, how does the trustee compel the issuer A to agree a price with C in the event of the merger answer is very straightforward. The trustee is given default powers if A cannot agree a conversion price for the bondholders into the shares of C. And that works. It means, however, that you're relying entirely on the trustee to agree the conversion price into the shares of C Corporation, the successor entity, after the merger. And that's normally, in practice, what is done in order to protect the convertible bondholders right in the face of a merger which results in the termination of the existence of the issue of the convertible bond. Yeah. Sorry, 
Well, and you've got a major league problem, and that is why you use a trust deed structure. Yes, you're right. If you don't have a trust deed structure, well, I mean, I suppose you can do it by collective action clause procedure, but once again, the problem is very much that collective action clause procedure would mean one resolution followed by another resolution followed by another resolution and so on until a price is agreed with A as to what price um, bondholders may convert to C. But that's not a very satisfactory way of doing it. It's not that you can't do it. Of course you can do it. But you're running up against the same problem that you'll have resolution after resolution after resolution because C is going to come back and say, well, no, that price is not acceptable to me. Okay, in which case, what price are the bondholders prepared to convert? Answer, resolution again, discussion amongst the bondholders. And that causes a timing problem as well. So, next one down, which, which you're familiar with, all the assets and liabilities of the issuer, A, are transferred to B. The shareholders in A are given shares in B, after which A is liquidated. Now, that certainly means that the convertible bondholders become bondholders in B, and you run up against a very same problem. Yes, theoretically, the convertible bondholders have a right to convert into the underlying shares of B, but at what price? Nor can you use a price adjustment formula to try to protect the economic value of the conversion right into A's shares. Why? Because at the time the convertible bond is issued, nobody's got any idea with whom A might merge in five years' time or six years' time. So once again, you've got the notice provisions which enable the convertible bondholders to convert prior to the merger. But once again, just like in the previous, the previous example, you've got the problem of the potential or the possibility that the market price of um, B shares, C, sorry, A shares are below the strike price, in which case there's absolutely no point in a convertible bondholder trying to convert or wanting to convert. So you're back to the same solution, namely trustee, as, as in the previous case. Okay, third type of merger. I think we've talked about this one before, haven't we? Maybe. Um, this is the case where your issuer A transfers nearly all its assets and liabilities or 75% plus of its assets to B, its merger partner, in return for B issuing shares to A, which means A becomes a shareholder in B and it's not liquidated, it continues to exist with whatever assets and liabilities are left on the balance sheet after the transfer by way of a merger. It's a kind of merger, it's not a true merger, but it's, it's, it's referred to as a merger because of what is happening here. The shareholders of A continue to hold shares in A, they're not given shares in B. The convertible bondholders can continue to be convertible bondholders in A. And yes, they can certainly convert the bonds at the original conversion price, into the shares of A, but question, what is the value of that conversion right? Answer, not a lot. It's virtually useless. So once again, the usual formula is to use a notice provision saying, in the event of such a merger being on the horizon, bond convertible bondholders will be given a notice by A to enable bondholders to convert into the shares of A prior to the merger. But again, it may not be very helpful. If you go back to this diagram, you'll see the problem. Convert into the shares of A. Next question, what exactly is, are the prospects for A Corporation? All its assets or its valuable assets have been transferred to B. What is the likelihood of these shares rising in value the way they were as they were expected to? It's, it's within the group in the sense, but yeah, but don't forget that although shares are issued by B to A, A does not become a parent company of B because the share holding could be well below 30%. So 
So yes, broadly speaking, they are within the corporate group of B, but it's not a subsidiary. And then comes, okay, um, takeovers. That is the case where your issuer, A, is subject to an offer by a bidder, B corporation, whereby B offers not to A but to its shareholders um, an offer to, at a price to buy the shares in A. Now, if that offer is accepted by the shareholders of A either for cash or for cash plus shares, depending on the terms of the offer, what happens? Answer, A becomes a subsidiary of B Corporation because it has now bought all the shares in A. Next step that happens is that if a substantial amount of shares, usually even up to 70%, is bought by A Corporation, sorry, not A Corporation, B Corporation, A's shares are likely to be delisted on the stock exchange, which means the conversion price, the conversion right becomes meaningless because you can't really determine the price of A's shares after it is delisted. Consequently, the price adjustment formula that we've used previously in relation to corporate actions, again, doesn't work. It cannot actually protect the position of the convertible bondholders. Notice provisions can be used and are used in practice to enable shareholders in A, sorry, not shareholders, convertible bondholders holding bonds from A to convert the bonds into shares of A so that by the time the merger becomes effective, B Corporation, the bidder, must also buy the shares of the converting bondholders. So yes, that might work in many cases, but the problem once again is this. The share price could be lower than the strike price, in which case there's absolutely no point in the convertible bondholders converting the bonds at a price higher than the market price of the shares of A. There's a very good example of how this works in a U U.S. case, Broad and Rockwell Corporation, which I've, it's somewhere in my book, I think. Um, but otherwise, just have a look at it. You don't need to go through it in detail. It is simply an example of the problem that, yes, you can have notice provisions, yes, Convertible bondholders can be given the right to convert the shares, convert the bonds into shares. But if the share price, as it was in the, in, in, in the Rockwell Corporation case, the share price was below the strike price of the convertibles, well, it's a pointless exercise converting. So once again, we are back to our old friend, the trust deed. And this time, the trustee is given power to compel the bidder, B Corporation, to issue new replacement convertibles to the existing convertible bondholders of A to substitute, by way of exchange, a convertible bond issued by B in place of the convertible bonds which the bondholders are holding, which were issued by A. Now, that is a perfectly fair compromise. The problem is, at what strike price are these convertible bonds going to have embedded in them to enable the convertible bondholders in A to get the same economic value in relation to the new substitute bonds of B Corporation, the bidder? Well, that is then left to a trustee to agree. And needless to say, it's a, a, a trustee's power to agree the, the, the terms of the new convertible bonds, which will then be given by way of exchange to the existing convertible bondholders in A Corporation. I mean, that's a perfectly viable practical solution, give or take the argument about have we got a fair deal from um, B Corporation. But if the trustee can't negotiate something which it, it is comfortable with and which it needs to say is of equivalent economic value and is not prejudicial to the interests of the existing convertible bondholders, 
the trustee has power to call a default not on B because it has got no relationship with B, but call default on A. Now, why is that useful? Because if trustee threatens to call default on A, it might very quickly result in cross defaults being triggered in relation to A corporation, it goes into insolvency. In which case, why is B making a bid for it? Buying a dead corporation. Consequently, it's a very powerful tool, the threat of a, the calling of default on the existing issue of the convertible bond. And therefore, in practice, B would, if it's interested in buying A as a viable corporation, would indeed agree to um, the issue of new convertibles at a strike price, convert it being the bondholders being given convertible bonds in exchange for the existing ones, which will give the bondholders a right to convert into the shares of B. So that works. I mean, in, in practice, it works. I think most bond investors would be perfectly happy with the formula. The prob problem is, of course, ultimately, the bondholders have got to say yea or nay, because don't forget, it's a trust deed. If the trustee agrees this, it needs to be confirmed by extraordinary general resolution of the bondholders. So to that extent, there has to be a formula agreed by the trustee which is acceptable to the existing bondholders. Okay, so that's mergers, acquisitions, and takeovers. Um, we've then got to, hang on, where are we? Okay, sorry. We've got, we're going to look at some of the additional provisions in a convertible bond more terms and conditions which seek to provide protection to convertible bondholders. The first one that you come across is that convertible bondholders, as you know, have a right to convert at any time when the conversion period commences. There may be situations in which a convertible bondholder has converted its bonds into the underlying shares of the issuer. And then there is immediately afterwards a capital distribution or a rights issue done by the issuer of the convertible. If the capital distribution of the rights issue attaches to shares at a particular record date, at a specified date, specified in the capital distribution or the rights issue, and that date is prior to the date on which the conver convertible bondholder converts, convertible bondholder has no rights to those capital distributions. So to put the convertible bondholder who is converting on par with existing shareholders, because it's not illegally a shareholder at the time of the capital distributions record date, there is a condition in the convertible bond which provides that the issuer will treat converting bondholders as if they were shareholders, even though the record date of the capital distribution is before the date of conversion. Now, as you might have guessed, that means that there has to be board resolution of the issue of the convertible agreeing to this, because after all, this it would be an erosion of the rights of existing shareholders. Because convertible bondholders who are converting are getting capital distributions when they're actually not shareholders as of the record date. Consequently, it's, it's regarded as an essential in a convertible bond issue for bond investors to know that even though they convert their bonds into to underlying shares, after the record date of a capital distribution or rights issue, they would be entitled to it pro rata on the amount of shares that they convert. Now, there is obviously a, a, a time frame during which this clause will operate. It could be one week, two weeks, whatever the period is that one would choose in, in the convertible bond instrument. So that's the first one. Then you've got the issue of default and acceleration. Now, if there is going to be acceleration and there's a trustee who has decided to call a default and accelerate, then it is required to give all bondholders notice that 
such action is being taken, being taken by the trustee. If it is a collective action clause procedure, well, of course, you don't need it because the collective action clause is one taken by the bondholders. And therefore, it would be known to the convertible bondholders that by collective action clause procedure, bondholders are calling and putting, uh, putting the issuer in default. So it's simply a, a notice requirement, that's all. Uh, and once again, uh, it may be that the objective um, is theoretically anyway to convert the convertible bond into the underlying shares. As to whether a convertible bondholder will want to convert into the underlying shares of an issuer which is about to be put in default is a good question. But yes, it's there to give the convertible bondholders that option. The next protective clause, yeah. You know, it would really help if you sat there because otherwise I, I might see your hand going up. Go ahead, please. Collective, if it's a collective action clause yeah, procedure. Yeah? It's a collective action clause. So this one issuer, one um, bondholder that doesn't uh, has the convertible bonds and doesn't want to. Well, all the convertible bonds will, in practice, not be held by one bondholder. All the convertible bonds, all 800 million of convertible bonds issued, will not be held by a single bondholder. Of course not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The convertible bond instrument, and I haven't gone through every one because I'm assuming that you would have remembered the collective action clause procedure in a standard international bond issue. That is exactly what you will have in a convertible bond. I mean, one is, all that one is doing with a convertible bond is bolting on to a standard bond issue a number of provisions because of a special feature in this particular bond. Have I answered your question or am I, are we at different places? Okay, ask me again. What is it I'm missing? If it's the default is decided, then wants to, wants, I don't know why, wants to... Uh, convert. Convert. How does that one do it after this... Uh, this default well, it doesn't matter. The collective action clause procedure calls default. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a bunch of institutions who want to convert the bonds into the underlying shares, the best example of that would be a vulture fund. It would convert the bond into the underlying shares at the strike price, hold the shares until the negotiations for restructuring are gone through and the corporate entity is uh, put back into health and the share price goes up. So just like that, they, will, they go and say that we won't... Uh, they can. I mean, not saying they will, I said they yeah. can. Yeah. I mean, as to whether they should is another question. Uh, that's a decision for the bond investors. I only said that the one type of entity that you'd be very familiar with are hedge funds, vulture funds, which invest in defaulting bonds with a view to gaining the benefits when the corporate entity uh, is restructured. So yes, it, it, uh, there are many, many investors who would buy defaulted bonds. Yeah. Sorry, which scenario do you have in mind? Which fact scenario? You've got a trustee and you've got a convertible bond, okay? And I wish to convert. You wish to convert. You can convert. You have no dealings with the trustee. Remember? Your, your right is against whom? The right to convert. Against whom do you have it? The issue. Right? So the trustee doesn't... Trustee doesn't get involved in that at all. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Go back and look at your trust deed questions. 
the trustee steps in in a default scenario. The trustee steps in to manage a restructuring. It cannot restructure itself, but it can manage it. Short of that, payment of interest activities going on between the issuer and the bondholders is a matter for the issuer and the bondholders. Can you remember? Go back your... You will notify the issuer mm -hmm. that you are converting the, the bonds that you've got mm -hmm. and could the issuer now issue new shares okay. in place of the bonds for the value of the bonds at the strike price. It, it's as straightforward as that. Are you talking about a scenario, default scenario when you ask that question? I mean, in other words, no. no, okay. Okay, there are a couple of other protective covenants that need to be looked at. Um, most importantly, the convertible bond, or, or indeed a series of convertible bonds, could in total volume be a large amount. Now, if bondholders all start converting their bonds, there needs to be available authorized share capital, which the issuer can then issue by way of new shares to the bondholders who are converting. Therefore, it is necessary under applicable corporate law for the issuer to keep available a sufficient amount of authorized but unissued share capital, sufficient to enable all convertible bondholders who are converting to be given shares. No, you didn't understand that because I can bet you you don't know the difference between authorized and unissued share capital and you're not going to ask. Correct? Well, let me ask the class. Anybody knows the difference between authorized but unissued share capital? Yeah. Is it when the board has the right to issue shares so it's always the partner Sorry? Well, authorized share capital is the amount of share capital which is authorized for issue on incorporation and changed ongoing by board resolution and shareholder approval. That's authorized share capital. In other words, you, the corporation, can issue up to 10 billion of shares at the nominal price of $4 a share. That's authorized. doesn't mean they're issued. It means that if the issuer so wishes, it can issue shares within that upper limit. What convertible bondholders want to be sure of is that that figure, the authorized share capital figure, is sufficient to enable all converting bondholders to be issued with share capital. And that's why there's a covenant which says, you, the issuer, will maintain at all times available and, uh, and authorized share capital, which is unissued, sufficient to meet all conversions to be made by converting bondholders. Okay. Next one that needs to be looked at is preemption rights. Under most corporate law systems, existing shareholders have a primary right to buy shares or subscribe shares, new shares, which are being issued by a corporate entity. That is a standard corporate law provision in most developed jurisdictions. Now clearly, if that provision stood, as I've just described it, it means that the moment a convertible bondholder wants to convert those shares have to be first offered to existing shareholders, which would make it lunatic. Therefore, there is always a provision in the bond instrument which provides that there will be a board resolution disciplining preemption rights applicable to the shares which are issued on the conversion of the bonds. So that bond converting bondholders can receive the shares 
without being subject to a first call by the existing shareholders by way of preemption rights. Are you in any way familiar with these basic corporate law things, like preemption rights of shareholders? My goodness, that's good to know. <laughs> okay, right. Um, it says the trustee, that covenant is obviously given to the trustee, that, um, that the, the convertible bonds and the shares being issued pursuant to conversion shall be exempt from preemption rights. The third one, which is at the top of the slide, um, perhaps less important but not by no means unimportant, that there cannot be any modification of the rights relating to the ordinary shares of the issuer, because that, those are the shares which the bondholders will be converting into. And secondly, that the issuer will not create another class of shares which have better rights than those into which the convertible bondholders can convert their bonds. Go back and look at your corporate law, I and mean, this might become a little bit clearer if you start looking at your corporate law stuff. Okay. There's another standard clause which allegedly for the protection of bondholders, but I think if you look at this clause, it results in a very curious result. It's a clause which deals with interests on the convertible bonds and the dividend on shares being um, made by the issuer. And the clause affects bondholders who are converting their bonds. First part of the clause reads that no interest will be paid on the convertible bond for the interest period from the last interest payment date on the bond and the conversion date. Now, that's perfectly understandable. If the interest payment date is March 30th, next interest payment date June 30th, you convert in May, you're not entitled to interest payments up to the conversion date. So you lose interest from 30th of March to your conversion date in May. Once the shares are allotted to the bondholder which converts, another clause kicks in. Dividends are not payable to the converting bondholder for the financial accounting period during which the conversion is effected. If the converting bondholder has received interest on the bond during that financial period. To understand how it works, Here's how it works. Supposing dividend on shares was made 1st March 2017. On 30th March, the, an interest payment was made on the convertible, 30th of March. On the 20th of May, the convertible bondholder converts its bond. Now, let's work through what happens. No interest is due on the convertible bond for the period 30th March to 20th May, because that's the period in which the last interest rate period is 30th March to 30th May, right? Now you've forgotten how the bond interest periods are done in a bond, right? So when I say a quarterly interest payment period, you've completely forgotten what that's about. So let's just, let's never mind all that, let's just home in on this. Interest period, every three months, 30th March, and in this case, the last one, interest payment, 30th March on the convertible or indeed any other bonds, 30th March 2017, next one due, end of um, June 2017, right? So that amount of interest for that period is not payable to the convertible bondholder up to 20th of May 2017, even though it was holding a convertible bond which was accruing interest. 
at the interest rate on the convertible bond. So no interest. Secondly, there was a dividend declared on the 1st of March. It's not entitled to that dividend because it does not become a shareholder until after conversion date on the 20th of May 2017. So that's okay. But then comes the next one, this clause which says, dividends are not payable to the converting bondholder for the financial accounting period of the corporate during which the conversion is effected if interest has been paid on the bond during the financial period and prior to conversion date. Now let's apply that to these. Financial year end March 2016-2017. Dividends paid on the 1st of March 2017. So when will be the next dividend date? March 2018. That's the financial year. During that financial year, at the end of that financial year, the converting bondholder will not be entitled to the dividend because it has received interest, namely that one, 30th of March, sorry, 30th of March 2017, during the financial period in respect of which dividends are to be paid. Dividends are to be paid 2018, 2019, sorry, 2017, 2018, and during that financial year, you've, been re you've received interest. When? There. The, the dividend year is 1st March to 1st March 2018, and you received an interest payment during that year. Result? You're not, enti you're not entitled to the dividend because the clause says, very simply, as I've just summarized it, if interest has been paid on the bond during the financial period and prior to conversion date. It's something you need to watch when you're advising a bond investor um, with regard to the impact of conversion. Okay. Uh, a few things to talk about with regard to bonds with equity warrants, which we haven't um, looked at in any more detail than at the very beginning. You remember that they are financial instruments issued without an issue price, nil paid as it's called, issued simultaneously with the parent bond, the convertible, sorry, not the convertible, apologies, simultaneously with the host bond, along with the host bond. And the warrant, if you remember, confers a right to subscribe a specified number of new shares at a strike price specified on the face of the warrant. And you remember that unlike a convertible, you're certainly getting new shares, but you've got to pay for them, unlike in a convertible where the, the payment is by way of the conversion price. The warrants are traded separately from the bond, even though they are issued with the bond at the same time. And you'll find that the value of the warrant is very similar, well, not very similar, nearly similar to the value of the conversion right of a convertible bondholder. In other words, it is affected by the same corporate actions that we've talked about in relation to convertible bonds. And therefore, an equity warrant, there will be terms and conditions which are exactly the same as those we talked through in relation to a convertible bond to protect the interests of the warrant investor or warrant holder. Two or a couple of other things. If the host bond is redeemed prior to its maturity, logically, because they are two separate instruments, it should have no impact on the existence of the warrant. But a specific term in the warrant provides that the warrant right terminates if the host bond is redeemed or defaulted. So 
that's an important thing to remember because theoretically, in, 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 in legal theory, the warrant is a separate financial instrument. It doesn't terminate when the host bond is defaulted or is redeemed. But in practice, there is a specific clause which says if the host bond is defaulted or if the host bond is redeemed, that's the end of the matter. The warrant also terminates. The right terminates. But in relation to default, at least, there's a protective provision which says that notice must be given to the warrant holders either by the issuer or, if there's a trustee, by the trustee in order to enable the warrant holders, if they so wish, to exercise their rights to subscribe. I'm done on equity convertibles and warrants. We are going slow, coming nearly to the end of all these instruments which were, I was about to say Greek again, sorry, not Greek, ancient Hittite to you when you first came. So that's the end of that bunch. I have one other that I need to talk to you about. Any questions before I move on? I hope I'm not going too fast. I'm trying to finish the class today, <laughs> finish the, le the lecture content today. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a notice provision which says you must give notice of the impending or announced takeover offer. Are you talking takeover, right? To convertible bondholders. So the moment a, a takeover offer is made in the markets for the issuer of the convertible, the issuer of the convertible is then obligated to give notice to the bondholder saying there's an issue on the table, uh, there's an offer on the table for, um, by a bidder to tip by all of the shares. So at that point, the convertible bondholders have a right and an option to exercise their conversion right into the underlying shares because if they do convert, it means that the bidder must make an offer not just to existing shareholders to but also to converting bondholders. The problem is the same one as you came across previously, namely that if the share price in the markets of an issuer is lower than the strike price contained in the convertible, there is little value in actually converting, even if it is to take the benefit of the takeover offer. No, not clear yet? Well, I mean, if someone is being silly, they'll convert. If they're being prudent, they won't convert. Um, and they will rely on the trustee provision to compel a corporation, there is the issue of the convertible, to negotiate terms with C or B, for that matter, the B, the bidder, to issue um, substitute convertibles in the event that the takeover goes ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, I guess this is going to be the last topic on this various transactions we've been looking at. Uh, I mean, I think this this stuff is reasonably easy because you're building on bond issue structures, bond issue documentation, and, 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 and the legal aspects of a standard international bond issue. And all you're doing is adding bells and whistles to it. So that's why a convertible bond is simply a bond like anything else issued in the same way with the same um, rules and regulations applicable. For example, if you were to say, what are the regulations applicable? Straight answer, EU prospectus regulation, and on, on the U.S. side, Regulation S and 144A, nothing new. The only difference, if you want to think this one through, is that a convertible bond is treated for United States securities law purposes as being subject to both the test for debt securities and the test for equity securities for purposes of SUSME, working out whether you're a Category 1 issuer. So that I think we talked about, but if you have forgotten, just jot it down um, and um, refer back. Okay. What I'm going to do next um, is not to deal with a bond, but to deal with a financial instrument which is issued and traded 
in the way that international bonds oh God, are issued, structured, and traded. They're called Global Depository Receipts, or GDRs. Now, first things first, what on earth am I talking about when I say GDR? It stands for Global Deposit Receipt. But what exactly are these things? Well, they are part of a group of instruments you see in the markets. Uh, there are ADRs, which are domestic instruments issued by U.S. corporations, American Depository Receipts. There are some which are referred to as IDRs, which are international depository receipts, and some which are called global depository receipts. You'll see that if it's an IDR, this is terminology, there's no magic to it, but ordinarily, if an IDR is sold in the markets and is sold outside the US, it's called an international depository receipt. If, on the other hand, it's sold under Regulation S outside the US and under Rule 144A into the US, you call it a global deposit receipt. This is just terminology. No magic to it. Now, how does it work and what are we trying to achieve here? This is not a bond issue. That's the first thing to remember. It's actually a share issue. But what is reaching the market are not shares. It's a new financial instrument created out of the shares. Buyers in the markets, investors in the market, get something called depository receipts and not shares. The depository receipts are issued by a bank which takes on deposit shares being issued by a corporate entity. So you first got a corporate entity which will issue shares. All those shares are put on deposit with a bank. The bank, having taken the deposit of shares, simultaneously, simultaneously issues global depository receipts to investors instead of distributing the shares. The two issues, the two financial instruments, the shares and the GDRs, are in practice issued simultaneously. It lands in your bank's deposit vault, and then on the back of it, simultaneously, GDRs are issued. The DRs, the Global Deposit Receipts or GDRs, are structured so that they represent the economic and commercial value of the shares on deposit. But they're not shares. Very important factor to remember. They are not shares. And they are independent financial instruments from the shares. So, yeah. Uh, we'll come to all of that. There's a long way to go. You're absolutely right in raising that question. First thing to remember is that it is a financial instrument issued particularly by a bank. It's only a bank which issues DRs because it's only a bank which can take the shares on deposit and issue these instruments. And the way it's structured is that each GDR that's issued by this bank will represent a share on deposit with the bank, a share, or a number of shares specified in the GDR, i.e. this GDR represents two shares or three shares held on deposit by me, the bank. The GDR gives a right, a legal right, to the GDR holder the delivery of the shares on deposit. It's a right against the depository and nobody else, the depository bank. It does not make the GDR holder an entity which has got title or ownership in the shares to which the GDR relates. The rights of the GDR usually, and this is very, a very important word, usually mirrors the rights that are contained in the shares on deposit. I think that perhaps answers the question that was raised. What about voting rights? What about this and what about that? What about rights to dividends? Yes, those rights which are attached to the shares would ordinarily, not always, be transmitted 
to investors in GDRs by specific terms and conditions in the GDRs. But, but you do need to remember these are different legal instruments. So the structure, again, using a bond issue structure, you have an issue of shares, which would be a corporate entity. It issues the shares to whom? A depository bank. What does the depository bank do? It issues GDRs to investors, just as someone would issue international bonds in the global markets. Where are they held and traded? The usual suspects, Euroclear, Clearstream, DTC. Um, how is it done? Usual bond issue structure. Managing underwriters, selling the GDRs into the markets, um, into the hands of investors whom they are dealing with. Same, I mean, there's nothing different in the structure of marketing and distribution from an international bond. And to that extent, there are tremendous similarities in the way they work. And you might want to ask, why exactly are we doing, sorry? There is no title to the shares in the hands of the GDR investor. If you have the shares delivered to you, then you become a shareholder. Just like in bonds, you have the definitives delivered to you through the, from the clearance system, you become a bondholder, remember? Yeah, it's the same structure. Sorry? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah. No, 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 it's not a derivative, luckily. It just looks that way. They get some exposure to the shares. They get an exposure to the shares, and in that, theoretically, yes, the GDI is a derivative from the share, but it isn't because the, the pricing of the GDR doesn't always reflect the underlying shares. I'll come to that in, in a minute. Nor and I think here's the more important point, it's not a risk management instrument. It manages no risk. What happens in this structure is that shares on deposit are transformed into another financial instrument and then traded and sold. But the real question we've got to ask is why? Why are we doing this? Well, importantly, the largest use of GDRs are by emerging market issuers. And the reason why emerging market issuers use GDRs rather than share sales, if you think about it, is reasonably straightforward. Trading and clearance systems in many an emerging market are not terribly good. Take Euroclear, for instance, or DTC. If a trade is done, it's cleared T plus one, sorry, trade date plus one. If you go back to your own home jurisdictions and ask how long does it take for a share deal to clear, you'll re see the reason why many issuers in emerging markets um, will opt for the GDR structure because international investors are used to trades being cleared T plus one. And the idea of hanging around for 20 days for some stock exchange to clear the shares is not something that appeals to international investors. The second one is that GDRs are always denominated in US dollars. I haven't seen one in euros, and I'm sure there will be euro-denominated GDRs. Um, I mean, there's no reason why not. But they're traditionally de designated in US dollars. What's the advantage of that? Well, the investor is getting a dollar-denominated instrument. It is not getting a share designated in an emerging market currency. So they're far more inclined to invest in a dollar-denominated instrument than in a share denominated in a local currency. Next, it also overcomes, the GDR structure overcomes, one of the main uses in some countries, it overcomes the prohibitions in local corporate law, which prohibits 
foreign, in inv foreign investors of either buying shares in the local corporate or buying a certain percentage of the shares in that local corporate. And two examples stand out from the two biggest markets in this area, India and Egypt. Prohibitions on foreign ownership or of a certain percentage of shares in a local corporate. The GDR structure enables global investors to buy as much as they want of the shares which are on deposit. How do they achieve that? Because how do you get over the problem of foreign ownership? Answer, if you go back to this structure, the shares are put on deposit with a depository bank, and then the depository bank will keep the shares or register it with a local custodian bank. Very similar to the bond structure. You're using a custodian, but this time, because they're shares, the shares are registered in the name of the local custodian bank. So if you're in Egypt, you'll have an Egyptian custodian. If you're in India, you'll have an Indian custodian bank. So if you ask the question, who is the owner of the shares, answer is straightforward, a local company. No breach of the foreign ownership rules. Yeah. But this one? Yes. Well, I mean, you're not going to choose one which is going to have solvency issues. I mean, that would be disastrous and it wouldn't happen. And usually, it's not a rule as in securitizations. It's usually a very highly rated entity, even though it's a local entity. But that gets over the problem of no foreign ownership of shares because it's a local corporate entity and it, it, it takes the shares uh, as the registered owner. Right, moving on, let's look at, that's the logic behind it. Um, what happens to the structure, parties and documentation? Well, if you look at the list, you'll see who's involved. It's very straightforward. There's an issue of shares, which is a corporate entity from whatever emerging market jurisdiction you're talking about. There's a depository bank which takes the shares on deposit, which is also at the same time the issuer of the GDRs. Thirdly, there is a local custodian bank, which is the registered owner of the shares. And then you've got the usual underwriters, clearance systems, and everything else that you're very familiar with. Documentation. How do we document a GDR issue? Well, there are a number of instruments, what, uh, agreements. One is the deposit agreement. Second is the master GDR which is issued by the depository bank and is held in a clearance system, i.e. the usual suspects, Euroclear, Clearstream, DTC. And because the GDRs will be issued in two tranches in a global depository CTC, a regulation S tranche and a 144A tranche, there will be two master deposit receipts, one representing the 144A investors and the other representing the Regulation S. Sorry, not shareholders, GDR holders. Exactly the same as in a bond issue. You'll expect to see an offering circular because these are always listed on a stock exchange, the GDRs, not the shares. And once again, you will need, if you're not going to register this with the US SEC, which people don't want to do, you will end up with a standard European Union complying prospectus approved by a competent authority, exactly the same as we came across. Then there's the usual subscription agreement, just as in a bond issue. And finally, the custody agreement, which is an agreement between the bank depository and the bank custodian of the... Let's look at the terms and conditions. First of all, the terms and conditions of the GDRs. First of all, curiously, it gives rights to delivery to the GDR investor, GDR holder, of the underlying shares. It's a right against the depository, not anybody else, not the issue of the shares. Right to delivery of the underlying shares. Um, the title to the GDRs 
transfers only on registration on the books of the depository of the buyer, not till then. Thirdly, all dividends and capital distributions due on the shares are distributable pro rata to the GDR holders, but crucially, those payments have got to be converted into U.S. dollars. The right of the GDR holder, therefore, is a right to receive dividends and any other distributions in U.S. dollars, not in the currency in which they are distributed. We'll talk about how does that happen, because obviously somebody has got to convert the local currency di dividend distribution or capital distribution into U.S. dollars, and that somebody, to preempt the question, is the bank depository. It's, it is subject to, to an obligation to convert from one currency to the next. Um, there's also a right to distributions of additional GDRs if the issuer makes additional deposits of shares. Because we talked about the issuer putting on deposit shares on day one and GDRs being issued um, to represent those shares into the hands of GDR investors. The terms and conditions of the GDRs enable the issue of the shares, if it so wishes, to put more and more shares on deposit with the bank depository, with the condition that if more shares are put on deposit with the depository bank, then the GDR holders will have a right to receive additional GDRs to represent the new shares which have been put on deposit. That will work on a pro rata basis. So if I have 10 GDRs and there are 10 shares being put on deposit, I'm not going to get all 10. I will get whatever percentage that is represented by my 10 shares. Voting rights. I think that's the question that you started with. Um, usually the voting rights are exercisable. Sorry, voting rights on the shares are transmitted to the GDR holders, and they have a right to exercise those rights by giving instructions, not to the issuer, but to the depository bank. But in many jurisdictions, India being the classic example, GDR holders do not get voting rights in relation to the shares on deposit. Those voting rights remain with the depository bank. And interestingly, the depository bank, under the deposit agreement, which I'll come to in a minute, are under an obligation to vote those shares in accordance with the instructions of the board of directors of the issuer of the shares. It's a wonderful way of controlling what happens in a corporate entity. You dump a whole pile of shares with the depository bank, and that bank has got to vote those shares in accordance with the board of directors' instructions. Perfect. Um, rights issues. Again, GDR holders have a, a, a right to receive any distributions by way of rights in relation to the shares on deposit. Um, and then there are the same issues we looked at with regard to convertibles and warrants, and that is changes in capital structure, stock splits, and the like. And if there is any such change, then the GDR holders have a right to be issued with new GDRs representing the splitting of the stock or the consolidation of the stock or whatever capital structure alterations that's occurring. There's no adjustment formula as in convertible bonds. What you have is an obligation to substitute new GDRs representing the new share capital structure. Um, the deposit agreement, which is one entered into between the issuer and the depository bank, which controls the shares on deposit. Obviously, the first obligation is to act. Yeah. Sorry, just the question button to your slide. So, when the transfer of ICCDR changes on registration depository, is it in the same as in bond structure, which is if you're like if investor X sells investor Y, is that registered on the books of the depository or is it just a claim from Y to X? Well, remember that we are back to the same old structure account holders in the clearance system. Those are the people who will have first rights to the GDRs. Now, of course, they can sell it down the chain of sales, just like in a bond issue. But the 
difference from a bond issue is that the transfer from account holder A to account holder B of GDRs is not effective until that transfer is registered. It's not the same. That's not what happens in a bond issue. The transfer is effective the moment the trade is completed. Okay. Um, the second obligation of the depository bank is having accepted the shares on deposit, it must then issue and deliver a master GDR or two master GDRs if it's being sold into the U.S. as well as under Regulation S, uh, same day as the issue of the shares. Where does it go, the, 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 master G, the two or one master GDR? Just like in a bond issue, it goes straight into the um, clearance systems. It is also required then to appoint a custodian who, in whose name the shares will be registered, so you can then get over these local um, shareholder uh, requirements in some corporate law systems. Um, it also deals with the depository agreement. Also deals with what happens if the if the issuer puts in more additional shares on deposit. What does it have to do? Answer: Well, it's got to issue more GDRs in accordance with the prorater holdings of GDR holders. Um, importantly, the depository bank is a trustee, always is. Now, that means that if you're doing an Egyptian issue, you can't have the trustee sitting in Egypt. You need to have the trustee offshore, in a jurisdiction where trustees are recognized. So you would use the bank depository in a jurisdiction which recognizes a trust because then the shares are perfectly safe because the holder is now a trustee holding the shares for the benefit of the GDR holders. Um, but the title, remember, is with the custodian bank. It's also got the obligation of maintaining that register we were talking about, the holder of GDR, so that whenever a transfer is effected, the depository bank needs to be notified and it then maintains the register of who is the GDR holder. Now, there are a number of obligations which arise in relation to the underlying shares. In particular, when dividends are paid, remember they are paid by the local corporate entity in local currency. Depository banks' first obligation when receiving dividends is to convert those dividends from the local currency into dollars and pay out the dividends due on the shares in dollars to the GDR holders. The same goes with rights issues, distributions of free shares. The, 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 the depository bank is required to distribute those pro rata to GDR holders. Um, there are some provisions which seek to give protection to the depository bank because don't forget it is a trustee and therefore as a trustee is is subject to heavy obligations unless they're stripped out like in an ordinary trust deed in a bond issue. And that's exactly what happens in a GDI issue where the depository bank is a trustee. Its obligations are controlled and managed and reduced to near zero by the same kinds of clauses that you're familiar with from international bond trust deeds. Regulation. I think I've dealt with this already, but just to be clear, um, they are treated as shares by the EU prospectus directive and the EU prospectus regulation, and therefore the prospectus need to reflect the requirements of a share issue rather than anything else. The GDRs, because they represent shares, are required to be treated as shares for the purposes of the disclosure requirements of the EU prospectus regulation. U.S. securities laws, once again, we are sailing under the safe harbors of Regulation S and 144A, but please do remember the GDRs are treated as shares by United States securities laws when SUSME is to be worked out and calculated. And finally, under United States securities laws, if a lockup is applicable, whether it's soft or hard, it's a one-year lockup because it's... Um, and equity security. And that's it, basically. Yes, questions? Um, uh, this one year uh, lockup, uh, if we sell the bond uh, issue, this one year lockup? No, there is no one year lockup in a bond issue. But here it is. 
it's a 40-day lockup in a bond issue. It's a one-year lockup for equity securities. And GDRs are treated as equity securities by United States securities laws. So it's a one-year lockup. No, if the lockup applies, it's a one-year lockup. Anything else? Yeah, please do. Regarding the structure, um, could you explain the relationship between the depository bank and the local one? Because as I understood it, the depository bank was the trustee. It, it holds the shares as trustee. But it's the local custodian. It's the local custodian in whose name the actual GDRs are registered. So for local law purposes, the local custodian is the holder of the shares, is the registered title holder to the shares. Now, the, the agreement between the depository bank and the local custodian bank will simply say, you will act in accordance with our instructions, full stop. So while it is the registered title holder to the shares, it must act in accordance with the instructions of the depository bank in relation to those shares. It's a, it's a very short agreement, and you will act in accordance with our agreements and hold the shares as um, uh, to, title to the shares. Yeah? Sorry? Who has the account in Euroclear? Well, the, the account in Euroclear will be these guys. Account holders in the clearance system will be the first-tier investors, just like in a bond issue. The GDR not the shareholders. So the GDR buyers, let's go back to the bond structure, will need to be account holders in the clearance system. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to buy GDRs, just like they can't buy international bonds. So as an account holder in the clearance system, you will be the first-year buyer of GDRs. And there are subsequent sales. Once again, you go through that same structure of electronic books and blah, blah, blah. Exactly the same as in international bonds. Yeah? Who would get the shares from the issuer? Well, the original corporation will issue the shares, but will issue it to the depository bank. Okay, let's go back. You're an issuer. You want to raise a billion dollars by a share issue. Now, you can do that by distributing the shares all over the place, or you can simply do this. Issue one block of shares worth a billion dollars to the depository bank, which then issues GDRs to international investors. You're not following it. Wow. Now, how can I help you understand it? This is an issuer which wants to raise finance, point one. That's why it will issue bonds, it will issue shares, it will issue convertibles, whatever it will help raise finance. In this case, the issuer has decided to issue shares. But in order to reach the global market of international investors, it can't issue those shares to them directly. Because one, if you remember, clearance problems. If a trade is done in relation to those shares, it takes 20 days to clear. Whether you're in Turkey or India or Egypt, the clearance systems are a heck of a lot slower than Euroclear, Clearstream, DTC. International investors will not buy in those circumstances because they're used to trade date plus one latest in terms of clearing a trade. Thus. There has to be some mechanism to convert those local currency Egyptian shares into something which investors, international investors will buy. Answer, you convert them into global deposit receipts. How do you do it? You put the shares on deposit with the depository bank, which simultaneously issues these instruments, financial instruments called global deposit receipts. Is it making sense or are you still lost? Sorry?
I mean, you may not need a local custodian, but usually there is one because when the shares are issued, it needs to be registered in somebody's name. The depository bank doesn't want it registered in its name because it'll get caught up by local regulations as a shareholder. Therefore, the transfer is made in the name of and to a local custodian bank, which is then the registered holder of the shares. The shares placed on deposit, however, are held by the depository bank as a trustee under New York law, English law, whatever law system you want to use. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't issue GDRs as a trustee. It is the issue of the GDRs. It holds the shares on trust. But uh, here in this scenario, if the depository bank holds the shares, what does the local custodian bank does? Not a lot, other than collect fees for being the local custodian and having the shares registered in its name. And it's usually because of no foreign ownership requirements of local corporate law. And this, uh, agreement what do you have in Georgia? I don't ah. I because if you just ask the simple question, can a US corporation or a Japanese corporation or a European corporation or a Chinese corporation come along and gobble up the shares of a Georgian corporation? Is the answer, yeah, no problem? Yeah, well, okay, if you say so. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, did you have a further question there? This custodian agreement, the visitory bank and this custodian. So, what is the nature of this agreement? Because one thing that I don't understand if this authorized shareholder is a local custodian. And not authorized shareholder, it's the registered shareholder. The registered shareholder. So I'm trying to get you to use the right terminology. Okay. Because the shares are issued by the issuer yeah. under a deposit agreement with the depository bank, whereby the depository bank agrees to accept on deposit the shares to be issued by the issuer. Secondly, it agrees to have them registered in the name of the local custodian. And thirdly, it agrees to act as trustee in relation to the shares on deposit. Well, why is this complex? All right, have a think while I answer the question over there. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, the GDR share delivered to you, right? The GDRs are delivered, not the shares. Yeah. But delivered in global form, and global form only. To you, Yeah, exactly. Two GDRs, one master GDR representing regulation S, tranche, the second one representing the 144A tranche. Two master GDRs both lodged with the clearance systems. Always is. I mean, there's no need for an Egyptian issuer of shares to be placed on deposit with a depository bank to issue the GDRs in Egypt. Absolutely not. Could be issued out of Germany or Switzerland or England, wherever you want to go. It will be the depository bank which will issue the GDRs. And if you're looking at international investors, it will be more attractive to issue from a jurisdiction which international investors regard as, what's the word I'm looking for? Developed, sophisticated, whatever. Safe, secure. So no, usually they would be issued out of a jurisdiction which international investors are comfortable with. I mean, every GDI issue I've done has been done out of London, whether it was Egypt, Turkey, India, I'm just thinking of three or four countries which were regular issuers of GDRs. And they were all done out of London. 
Yeah, the custodian, local custodian is always there because that's, it's a technique of getting over the problem of local registration. Now, Indian lawyers have said, oh, the courts can actually look through the corporate veil. Okay, under what circumstances? And that means you go back into corporate law to see in what circumstances the corporate veil can be lifted. And one problem is that some jurisdictions will say, well, if you're using this structure to overcome local no foreign ownership rules, a court might lift the veil of corporate secrecy. But it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. No, 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 custodian does not issue GDRs. GDRs are issued by the depository bank. All that the custodian does, all that it does, is simply to lend its name to have the shares registered in its name as a local holder of the shares, local registered owner of the shares. That's all. It does nothing else. Yeah. The, local, the shares are issued in a local currency, but they are not sold to global investors. So GDRs are sold to global investors, but the GDRs are denominated in dollars. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not an investment banker. Can you use, can you dump an equity convertible into a, a, into a depository bank and issue GDRs on the back of it? Why would you want to do it? For what purpose? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What is it? Okay, straight answer to your question is that, generally speaking, the GDR price in the market will reflect the movement in the share price in the local market. But that is not always the case. Because you've converted the shares into something else, for example, trading risk which would attach to the shares, and therefore, if, for example, the share markets in the issuer's country are subject to major turbulence, share prices can fall. That doesn't affect the GDRs, because the GDRs have nothing to do with the local share trading turbulence, or indeed the collapse of the local share trading. You're not concerned with it because the shares are there. And the trading is done via these three extremely sufficient international clearance systems, and they're trading not shares, but GDRs. So the GDR price can sometimes vary. And don't ask me for the mathematical formula on the basis of which it works. But usually they are the, pretty much, they reflect each other. But there are variations sometimes. I'm just giving you an extreme case where there is total collapse of the local share trading market. The exchange, in other words. Yeah. Is the depository bank required to No, it's not necessary because it's, it's the buyers of the GDRs, just like buyers of bonds who need to have shares in Euroclear. But if you're asking me the question, does it make it life a lot easier if the depository bank does have an account in Euroclear so that when it issues the GDRs, it can transfer the GDRs from its account into the accounts of Account holders in the clearance system, the answer is yes, but it's not necessary because the, the, the depository bank can simply issue the shares into the accounts of account holders by simply transferring the shares to the, the, to, to, to the clearance system.
No, no. The managing underwriters will be buying the GDRs from the depository bank. But they will not be buying it for their own account except in the case of a 144A issue. Agreed? So when they carry out an underwriting function, their underwriting function in a GDI issue is exactly the same as in a bond issue. In a bond issue, they don't need to buy the shares. They sell the shares into the hands of first-year global investors. It's exactly the same in a GDI issue. I didn't go into all this because I thought I'd sort of lock in the international bond structure onto this, which is what you need to do. It's just exactly the same. And all I've given you is the variations from the bond issue structure. Are we there? Oh, one more. Two more. No. If you think about the logic of the local custodian bank, it is to overcome restrictions on foreign ownership applicable to the issuer. So by definition, this custodian has to be in the same jurisdiction as the issuer. No, 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 please don't use SPVs. These are real corporations. No, no, I mean just like uh, your SPVs is the asset, but the legal title is belongs to the trustee. The legal title is registered in the name of the local custodian. The trustee has the title to the shares, the ownership of the shares, which are registered in the name of. And has therefore, yeah, go ahead. No, as I kept saying, there are two master GDRs issued. There are no definitives, ever. It's always permanent global form, master, two master GDRs in practice. One for 144A, one for Regulation S. <laughs> They're going to have to be told that these are very different instruments. Anything else that you want to talk about? You want to speak up, please? For the registration of the shares. That's all. Shares default? Uh, the they don't default. Is, is your, uh, to the okay. Um, who will take the responsibility For what? Of if the issuer goes into insolvency, the shares are valueless. Yeah. But why the local the, the risk? What risk? It's got, it's, there are shares registered in its name which are valueless. So what's the risk? It's got no obligation to anybody else. It is simply obligated to the depository bank to register the shares in its name. Full stop. No other responsibility. There's something that is circulating around the class which is something to do with your knowledge of corporate law which is raising all sorts of questions, which I think, hang on, why is that question coming up? And it's another one. I mean, if the, if the issuer goes into insolvency, the shares become valueless, don't they? Okay. <laughs> and there is no default. This is not a bond. It's a share, which is then represented by a GDR when transformed through the depository bank into a GDR. There's no default scenario. I mean, if the dividends are not paid, is there a default? Ordinary corporate law. No dividends paid for three years. Is there a default? What's the answer? I thought so. This is all to do with your understanding of corporate law. Well, there isn't one. Corporate entities can pay dividends when they wish, 
when they like. If they don't pay for five years, people might sell their shares, but there's no default. Okay, maybe you should just ditch this subject and <laughs> forget about it until you understand corporate law a little bit better. Any, sorry, other questions? Okay, once again, who issues the GDRs? Uh, the, the, sorry? Depository. The depository bank. So if I'm buying GDRs from a depository bank, my rights are... Well, that's why I said the depository bank is the only issuer of the GDRs. Nobody else is issuing GDRs. No, exactly in a bond, like in a bond issue. Yeah, but they have the right to deliver the deposit. They have rights to delivery, they have rights to dividends, they have rights to capital distributions, just like in any other bond issue structure. Where in bond issues, you'll have rights to get the interest and principal. Equally in this structure, the GDR buyers would have rights to dividends paid on the shares, to capital distributions paid on the shares, to rights issues attaching to the shares, and so on. Down the chain of sales. Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? Sorry, what? Oh, right. Um, just one, other, two other things. I guess it's quarter to five, so I think we'll try and stop here. Um, there's no more in terms of topics to be covered in LOIF one. We are done. Um, what I thought we might do is next week, I mean, I know it's going to be a waste of time, but let's try and do it anyway. Uh, people have asked for a revision class. Judging by the number of questions in the seminars, the impending revision class next Wednesday will be another write-off of two hours. But if you want it, we'll have it. But the only way we are going to do that is if people are going to put down questions that they need or want or like to be discussed. Those questions, please send to our pathway. Secretary will make a long list because I'm sure there'll be five different people answering the same, asking the same question. She will consolidate it, send it to me, and if there's sufficient, let's have this revision class. If there aren't, people aren't interested, please, you don't have to come because you're done and you've got the seminars to develop your understanding of the topic and to follow through its back pattern. But if you want a, a review class, we're going to have it next week. How many of you want a review class? Kind of half the class, not half the class. Okay. Fine. We'll have it for those who want it. Sorry? And secondly, uh, your pathway secretary has another announcement. Next Friday, we have an event at King's. You will get an email, but if you are, are up to it and if you want to attend, there is a cap of uh, 110 people. So please send me an email, and I will just. Send, and when it's over, like when we have this 110 people, there will be an over. So if you have time at 22nd of March, from 8 till 10, uh, you are invited to. Yeah, and this alcohol is included. <laughs> you saw the, the question is how much alcohol is going to be distributed free and how much is going to have to be paid for? I think the event she's talking about is a drinks reception. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So if you want to, while you are here, now you have this like benefit to just even if now you know if, if you have time at 20 seconds, just uh, send me an email now, so you'll be definitely included because when it's uh, up to like 110, then I can. Okay. Yeah, one, one other question at front. I'll put my uh, email here so you can text me. And yeah, one more question. Uh, 
all the antiques. All right, guys, for those whom I'm not going to see next Wednesday, because I don't think everybody's coming, good luck. Best for, best for the exams and best for the job front. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all the best. I hope you enjoyed the course and you will have an opportunity to actually evaluate it if you want to. Yes. What are you doing? No, just... No. What are you doing? Just uh, where to send it. Oh, oh, where to send it. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll get emails. All right. You, do you have, do how many people are going to come to this revision plan? I'm not going to waste my time with them. I think we should, and let's see who emails you. Then you can count the number of people. I mean, it's 10 people, I mean, it's a waste of time. Can do it. Well, except that if it's only five people telling you a question, they can easily ask the same questions like the same number. Please, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Hey, how's your job application going? I wanted to sit down with you and see where you were going with this thing and whether you needed anything more. And what happened to that? I'm just waiting. It's closed next time. No, so I I was recommended as well. From this. I met one woman, the guy. At no, Yeah, and I meet her, she's, she's in Istanbul, and she's one of the heads of this. Okay. So if I manage to communicate and persuade her that I'm worth something. Are you meeting her? Yeah, I, I met her, and she said, like, you could go over to Okay. I would say I would. But it's not a formal interview. No, no, no. It's just informal. It's just informal, but if you can bring me a reference. Me? Of course. <laughs> I'm absolutely no problem. I mean, I'm happy to do that. No, of course. I mean, just tell them to either email me, ring me, whatever it is. Yeah, it's it's yeah absolutely. Fine. But what else are you doing on the job part? I know you're quite keen to yeah, find a way. Why don't you apply to the investment? Just, just write to them. How else do you do it? Send an email to not for human resources. They're a waste of time to the head of legal. And all you got to do is find out the name of the head of legal by ringing up. So, uh, okay, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, Deutsche Bank, Nomura, BNP Paribas, you know, the usual suspects. Yeah, I mean, just write to them. Just get the name of the person. And you can look it up even online and see who it is. Yeah, and then you can um, write to them. Email. Yeah, absolutely, everybody does. The only way to do it, you don't wait. Yeah, for and then I'll then I'll tell you, then I'll update you that if it's something that was so poor fingers. Because you know, actually, my this advantage for me is that they actually don't need you from British people or America. What don't they want from British people? They don't want that. They know one from developing countries. So yeah, EBI doesn't want anybody yeah. else other than people from um, quote unquote Eastern Europe and near Europe. My they call it. Is, yeah, maybe my. I mean, it's not that fluent. The other place. Sarah, that might interest you. Where are you going now? Um, I'm going to get a copy. Do you want to come? Yeah, let's go. Um, the other place you might want to think about is the European Investment Bank, except it's in London. I'm sorry, but Turkey is not.